Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John. And welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies both new and old with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right, and to avoid any lazy negativity, we are making this a drinking game. A what? A oh, drinking game. I'm so sorry. Did I stutter? I said this is a drinking game. I am right? surprised by this. <laughs> so if you hear any negative comments about a film, or I think today we're going to go ahead and add a little bit of a gush alarm. So if you hear us gushing too much about a film, <laughs> or if we say something stupid, you're going to hear this sound. <laughs> Which means we said something negative, stupid, or gushy, and we have to take a drink. We're going to drink a lot, basically. Oh, dear. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> to get another beer. And so pour yourself a glass, join us, give it up for the films we love, and perhaps film that needs some love. Mm-hmm. This Ooh, week. we got three films to talk about from the film yeah. year 2016 but first Ooh. why don't we go ahead and send it over to john for some shout outs shout outs all right shout outs as always we want to throw it to our beer sponsor i swear he's not our imaginary spear sponsor beer sponsor we actually did drink his beers at one point for two episodes three episodes before the show yeah happened. it was about three episodes yeah I think so. so. I don't remember. I can't wait. I know. God, I wish they were still in our hands. His name is Carlos Barozo. You can find him on Instagram at C Bar 2019. That's C B A R R O Z O B A R 2019. He's got some fun posts, keeping it up to date with all the brewing he's doing. Really good stuff. And as always, the music you hear on this episode and every episode is provided by the artist Dasein. That's Dasein, D A S E I N. You can find all the music available for free downloads at soundcloud.com forward slash docine dash artist. Guys, for some fun, skip back to like episode one and two. John's got a lot better at spelling those. Oh, Dude, that yeah. was tough. <laughs> going so fast. He did, he did it for memory last week, which is so great. This is all, this all right. memory last week. Crazy. Friends, <laughs> we're going to talk about the, a couple films from the film year 2016, which was a surprisingly decent film year, I would say, mm. overall. Uh, but yeah. let's do a quick round of what you've been watching. John or Dave, any either of you want to get started first? What you've been watching, David? Oh, I, I this week I didn't I didn't really do the movie thing. I, there was no movies uh, to watch this week. I, I did a lot of TV, none of it yeah. reality. Thank you. Uh, Damn I, it. I, I, Thank I, you. I caught up uh, caught up on like I'm about three quarters of the way through season one of Doom Patrol, the DC show, which is now on HBO Max. It's on Max. Um, yeah, it's weird as hell and funny. It's whoa, it, wait, wait, wait. a lot. HBO produced it, or did did they just no D- it by it? DC Universe produced it? But uh, all the DC shows are now kind of migrating over to HBO. I think they're going to eat them soon. Wow! So that you'll is, see that's... Titans. I I would predict you'll see Titans and everything move over to HBO Max. Um, that's fine by me. With Peacock, yeah, me too. Like, and every network has their own app. Yeah. Like I, I don't know where to put my money at this point. It's getting yeah. complicated. The, the the best thing to happen to me this week: Umbrella Academy is back on Netflix, season two. Wow, season two. It's, okay. It's just as weird and fun as ever. Uh, and I started Devs. I haven't seen it. Alex Garland. Dev, right? Devs yeah. is a it's a Zach Galifianakis in his uh, a really good role actually. It's. Yeah, is it his show too? Did he write it and like create it and stuff? Or is he... I I don't know. Uh, all I know is it is uh, not not well. I don't even know what to think. I've seen one episode and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And yeah. it's yeah, it's got me hooked no, a little bit. Devs is Devs is Alex Garland show. Alex Garland did Ex Machina, wrote and directed. Oh, oh God. there you um, go. Oh, so oh, shit. So yeah. So that it's explain, a sci-fi. That explains all the complexes. Yeah. <laughs> also, we're, we're shouting out Hulu a lot today. More on Hulu in a second, but Devs is available for stream on Hulu, I believe. But also, oh, it's FX. Really? Oh, okay. cool. yes, dude, it is. Definitely, I definitely FX. I did not, I did not connect the dots, dude. I've been super excited to see yeah. that. I knew he's been working on it for a while. I'm a big Alex Garland fan over here. Hmm. Anyway, that's me. It aired from cool. March of April of 2020. Is that a shittier time to air anything of your yeah, entire life? Nobody... March 13th. Hey, did you watch Debs? <laughs> no, sorry. I was running for my fucking life, Alex Garland. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was <laughs> so sorry. Uh, yeah, he's, was he's just sitting there somewhere in mask going, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Dave, keep watching it and let us know how it is because I hear good Absolutely, things. Absolutely, right? yeah. Yeah, I also wanted awesome. to catch uh, the third series of Darks on Netflix. It's a, fo- yeah. a German show. Uh, all about time travel. It will bend your fucking brain. It's worth the watch, though. Yeah, I've heard everyone the say amazing mm-hmm. things about that show. I still have not leaned into it. I think I resisted for a while because somebody told me you had to watch it with the English dubbing, and I was like, I don't want to 
do that. I just wanted to watch it in no, German you can, with subtitles. Yeah, you can you can subtitle it. I I yeah, because I didn't realize the, the subtitles were there for the first season, so I I did watch it with the dubbing. It doesn't yeah. lose a lot. It's okay. still pretty good. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna give it a shot. Yeah, what you good. watching? I uh, I was just plugging away with the next generation, and I finished that Thomas Harris series. Can you, so mix, I this, can you mix this shit up? We're trying to talk about new things here, right? Not <laughs> new generation. I watched stuff. Uh, I watched Hannibal. That was my my right. contribution. Uh, yeah. I was so happy to see that pop up. Uh, that's on Netflix now, right? I saw it on Showtime, I think, but I can't remember. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That was fun. Really, Scott, mm. Hans Zimmer. Yeah, oh, you're talking about the movie? Okay, I, I mean the yeah, series. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, I did not watch the series. I had seen some of that series. I love that actor. Mm. Jeff, I know you like him too. Cena Royale. Yeah. What's that guy's name? Mads. Mads. Yeah, Mads. Yeah, Royal Affair. And the Royal Affair, of course. Um, is that it, John? <laughs> that's it. What reality cool. TV have you been watching this week, Jeff? <laughs> uh, did I watch any? I actually might not have, so that's pretty great. Uh, well, I, I did in a way, because uh, guess what? My brother got married yesterday. That's exactly Ooh, right. My yay. brother got Congrats married. Virtual Dan. Zoom wedding. A Zoom uh, wedding. Dan, Dan and Fallon. Yeah, so so I consider that live TV. We had a lot of live streams over Zoom, and yeah. you know they did a good job of getting I everybody mean, involved. So it was cool. Getting married is about as real like, as it gets. <laughs> Yeah, it was basically like a live receiving line because they got to, they got to get everybody involved. Everybody got talking. It was it was, it was cool. It was, it was definitely a very unique experience, and uh, they did it. They wanted to they wanted to get married. They didn't want to wait. Also, uh, their their date was September twelfth, so a year to the day if they wanted to do it on their one year anniversary is 9-11's twentieth anniversary. So it's probably oh for God. the best reason that Ooh. they were like, we just let's just get married now, and they just it was awesome. It was it was fucking great. My dad gave a nice speech. Everyone was great. It was so 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 nice. Um, so I saw that for sure. No pants. Uh, and in advance, yeah. yeah. And uh, before that, I so I'm working at a, a camp right now, and I'm I'm doing all the music for it. Music direct. I'm, I'm making tracks and playlists and stuff for all the kiddos. Mm. Camps should also always have a soundtrack. Yeah, I, for sure. K through twelve. So I'm making a lot of different kinds of tracks, a lot of music. And I was put on. There's an improv class going on at camp, and I was put on to teach musical improv. I've never taught musical improv. I've never done musical improv. I had no idea what the, uh, the teachers, did, did you know? You, did you watch the Freestyle Love Supreme? So I watched Freestyle Love Supreme yeah. <laughs> on Hulu yes. the night before my class, and I stole and bullshitted my way through this fucking class that I had to teach. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, we are Freestyle Love Supreme. For those of you who don't know, um, Lin-Manuel Miranda and others who created Hamilton, they were, well, the director of Hamilton, Tommy Kale, is an original founder. Lynn is sort of a founder, but it's really this uh, this other guy, Anthony. And shout out to, to John, our, our friend from college, um, Ashley Perez Flanagan, has become a part of it via her friend and now fiance, uh, Jelly Donut, who, if you've ever seen Freestyle Love Supreme, is a freestyler. Is, in this the group the, in... is this the group that started at the bottom of the drama bookshop in 40? That's exactly right. They started the mm-hmm. drama book shop in New York City. Um, they actually went to the Edinburgh Fr- Fringe Festival in 2005, which for your musical fans is two years before In the Heights came out on Broadway. So Lynn was basically doing Freestyle Love Supreme to do theater and do shows while he was doing In the Heights with pretty much the same creative team. Um, they have, and they, they're a freestyle group. So they have live music, they have musicians, they sing. Anyway, it's a fantastic, for those of you, just, just go watch it on Hulu. It's really, really fun. It's an hour and a half. And it's all about um, freestyle theater. It's not Eminem Eight Mile Battles. It's it's stories that they they take somebody on stage and they freestyle their day. They say, "What was the first thing you did when you woke up? Who did you talk to on the phone? What did you do? Yada yada yada." And they freestyle their whole day. They turn it into oh, a song. Oh, that school. that act would not work at the moment. So like, not, what, yeah, it was tough. Yeah, what, it was tough. what'd you do when yeah. you got out of bed? Um, right. um. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Uh, when and did then, you start drinking? <laughs> Today. <laughs> um, anyway, that's on Hulu. We are Freestyle Love Supreme. I highly recommend it. It's on Hulu. A little bit of Hamilton love in there. So if you if you love Hamilton, give that a look. And I, I Dave, because you recommend it, I, I've seen half of Palm Springs. Mm. I got a little behind on my movie watching for this week. So I will finish it. It's really good. Also on Hulu. It is Dave so much loved fun. it. Everybody yes. loves it. Andy Samberg. Everyone should see that. As soon as J.K. Simmons comes on his entrance, I was like, "Oh yeah, man, this is yep. gonna be great." So anyway, that's 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 what I've been watching. So also, um, stick stick through at least half the credits when you get to the end. Okay, good, good, good. I'll, I'll get there this week. Yeah. Um, okay, a little bit of news. So anything before this? Just make John? sure. Uh, what did we say? Uh, if you haven't yet, please like and subscribe and give us a mm. follow. The handle is the love at the love of cinema pod 
at the love of cinema pod. We need some love, yeah. everybody. We love Except you. Except on, on Twitter, it's at the love of cinema because they have a character limit. So it's just at the love of cinema. But for some fuckers in 2017, for Twitter, dude. <laughs> in 2017, some fuckers wrote the love of cinema. They made two posts and they still hold the domain. So kick those people off of Instagram so we can get our domain name back. Us. Yeah. Yeah. Damn it. I should crap. If they listen to this, man, they're going to start yeah. asking. They're going to start <laughs> making, oh, they're going to start setting a now. price. They're going to say, great, 10 grand. Give us the... <laughs> anyway. where they leave. Find where they leave. I'm going to go around their house and kick them in their fucking nuts. Yeah, Jesus if you guys know where they live, tell us that we can kick them in the nuts. Um, uh, not a lot of film news because the <laughs> Emmy nominations came out. All I know is that there's eight nominations per category, which immediately means none, nothing matters. They're, they're, they were like, TV's big. What it really means is that they're protecting their ass. They don't want to snub anybody. They're tired of the snubs. So if your favorite person didn't get nominated, it's because nobody watched their show. It's that simple. There's eight nominations per category. You're talking about comedy, drama, and limited series. I, I can't even imagine how long it's going to take just to introduce everybody's name. They're going to have to televise these off camera. Yeah, I mean, already, it's, it's, it's all going to be remote, so you don't have to play people off. You can just disconnect just, them if their speech goes too long. Just tell us who wants and move on. You don't even yeah. give them a speech. Tell them, tell them to write it out if you want to go see it. Like, Did you have a show so many this people. year that really stuck out to you? Did you have a fave that you kind of still think about? I really I think enjoyed the Mrs. One... America. Yeah, Mrs. America's cool. Um, cool. I, 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 have, I saw the first episode. I need to get back into that. Uh, my that cool. now sister-in-law recommended that to our family. Um, mm-hmm. I, I do think Watchmen was a surprise. I think the good thing about oh, Emmys, yeah. the good thing is, so uh, you're always sitting there and you're like, okay, Modern Family won Best Comedy four years in a row, and then it wasn't even nominated <laughs> at the end. They, they they stopped watching. It's it's that simple. They stopped watching. But the good thing about it, I love Mrs. Maisel. Mrs. Maisel season three uh, is great, yeah. but it's not that much better than season one. So they do a good thing sometime in the Emmys where it's like, they Maisel season one, just throw them the end, Emmys. Season two is Fleabag's year. So Fleabag is the new show. You have Atlanta's year. Right, Killing Eve yeah, has had like good, like good moments here. So I love that the Emmys are finally figuring out to spread the wealth. Because how does Steve Carell not have a yeah, fucking last Emmy? Year right? was like already so I think like, this year show is Watchmen, which is really yeah. interesting. Did he I know um, as well, it's getting a lot of weird. Yeah, Jeff, he's just been, He's totally <laughs> right, Jeff. Uh, Jeff is gone. Uh, oh, there he is. We lost you. Here he is. No, I'm back. No, the audio's still in. No, the audio's still there. They're not going to know. We were just amazing ourselves. What I was saying, my friends, is Watchmen is the most highly nominated show, and that was a surprising show. I would say yeah. so. I think Watchmen is rightfully, you know, getting the praise that it deserved. Um, other than that, oh, yeah. You know, nothing, yeah, I think everything else is, is you know, a la carte. Everything's fine after that. Hmm. But yeah. I, I was happy to see that. To be honest, well, we have gone on too long about this. Yeah. Uh, we <laughs> gonna move on to so the, we the stuff we're here to talk about. <laughs> That's right. So, filming no, 2016. I'm briefly gonna run through. So here, so this is the year. If you guys are you love the critical Oscar season stuff, this is La La Land versus Moonlight. Um, and that's kind of unfortunate because even though both of those films were great, um, <laughs> Jeff said something <laughs> stupid. Okay. La La Land oh, sucked. No, come on, <laughs> they did not. Oh, fuck you. Hey, but Dave, you. We yeah, outnumber dude, you. I we like, like we like La La Land better than uh, you. Whatever. I like. <laughs> um, so the big movies of the year, 2016, obviously a big comic book year. Captain America: Civil War, 1.1 billion worldwide. Mm. Rogue One. Yes. Uh, Finding Dory, Christ. Zootopia, and The Jungle Book. All Disney. <laughs> Top five. All Disney. All basically billion dollar movies. Secret Life of Pets, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, Fantastic Beasts, Where to Find Them, Deadpool becomes the highest yes. grossing R-rated comedy the of all time. The world changes when Deadpool Suicide came Squad. out. Suicide Squad, there's yeah. your top ten. So it's Disney and and um, Disney and fucking um, uh, uh, superhero movies. You also yeah. have uh, The Great Wall starring Mar- Matt Damon, which John and I saw and is one of the biggest pieces of shit we've ever seen. Mm. Um, <laughs> <sorry>. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I can't even prepare yourself. Um, it's, it's, it's okay. Like, I'm never. I'm never working in this industry again. So <laughs> no, uh, let's see. If you, I mean, if you were associated with the Great Wall, would you want to? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, a couple other shout outs. Sausage Party is pretty fun. Very, very vulgar to our younger oh, fans. Yeah, do not um, take your kids to see that animated flick. It's pretty fun though. Uh, Nocturnal Animals is a surprising cut that I yeah. think I, I don't know if people are going to watch it, but it's really cool. Isabel Huppert in, in L is great. Natalie Portman and Jackie was great. Fences is good. Lion is good. Manchester by the Sea is really good. And the best documentary is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen in my life, which is OJ Made in America, which is very, very long. And we have to give a shout out to 13th, the documentary by Ava yes. DuVernay. We mentioned, uh, Dave and I saw it um, early on in the George Floyd protests. And I we cannot, it, it, out of all of the movies we're talking about, if you've never seen 13th, that is definitely the one that I think you should go on Netflix right away. Yeah, and that's see just that movie. starter. 
That's your starter. That's your starter. It is so, yeah. so good. Um, it basically goes from the Civil War until now, and it talks about how slavery has led to this moment of of, of race, racial justice reform, at least um, people protesting in the streets. And there is a direct correlation between the 13th Amendment, which freed slaves, um, but did it. That's That'll be my tagline to get you yeah, guys to watch if, it. Yeah, if history... If especially if learning in general, but especially with history, if, if most of it is about un, uh, putting events in context over time to help explain somebody's perspective now, this movie is perfect at that. It will, mm-hmm. If you had never really deep, you know, deep dive into this kind of material, this kind of subject matter, you just heard general platitudes or anecdotes throughout the ages, then you need to watch this because it's just going to spell it all out very clearly so that yeah. you will understand exactly what some of the world has been experiencing for since then. Really good, yeah. really good. Hmm. Let's also talk about uh, Hacksaw Ridge was really good. I know maybe we're not supposed oh, to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hacksaw some, Ridge was good. Some notes. And you go um, ten, ten, 10 Cloverfield Lane. Oh, that yeah. was a, I, I really dug that film. I thought that was yeah. great. It was a, a solid... Uh, Entry. Yeah. If you have children, Angry Birds. That came was out this uh, year. Damien, Damien Chazelle wrote 10 Cloverfield Lane. That was one of his oh, first really? cells mm. in Hollywood before he got I, Whiplash Greenlight. I, I remember the, the trailer and then it was a bad robot, right? I forget yeah. who produced. Yeah, I think it was. Patriots yeah. Day. Um, Did we say Patriots Day? Patriots Day. Yeah, great. Conjuring 2. All right. Split. Warcraft. Yeah. Okay. So that was and Independence <laughs> Day too, is one of the I, love, I love how we mentioned just. I love how we mentioned Warcraft. Just move straight the fuck on. <laughs> yeah, on. yeah. Let's get out of there. Captain Fantastic's good. Okay, let's move on. Oh, Ghostbusters. We gotta say that. Come on, mm. Ghostbusters. Lady reboot. Ghostbusters. It was a great film with an, a questionable ending. But it was a, actually, there was some good stuff in the Ghostbusters. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. Dave stands. I, I Dave stands. Okay. I Okay, Dave, we can move on to what we're going to be talking about this week, which is three films that we've decided to choose, which are Arrival. Denny Villeneuve mm. it may go down, may go down in 10, 20 years as one of those filmmakers that changed the game, or at least stands out as as being one of the greats of this this era. I'm a fan. Um, so we're gonna do Arrival first, then we're gonna do The Witch, which is a really, really, really cool, really interesting um, horror thriller, a little supernatural. Uh, Robert Robert Eggers directed and written, and it's then hard we're to, hard to pigeonhole our- that one. We're gonna, yeah, exactly. And then we're gonna uh, do our redemption film, redemption of the week, or was it really that bad? Of X Men Apocalypse, Apocalypse played by Oscar Isaac, but it is the mm. third re- installment of the rebooted X Men series, mm. the Simon Kinberg series, if you will. Um, I'll be interested I've to hear ch- what you think of that. Can't wait. So I've been mm. chatty. Who wants to introduce Arrival? Because honestly, the setup is gonna be interesting. Since now that you've seen it, not twice, I'm assuming we've all seen it at least twice. Oh, yeah. It's it's like, I, I was trying to explain to the house here that I'm in, if they should see it. What, what's it about? I was like, it's an alien movie. And I was like, man, that's the shittiest way of, of talking about it this movie. It really it's, it's, is. I mean. And I was like, all right, it's a memory play. And I was like, no, now it sounds like, now it sounds like okay, um, it's, Tennessee it's the, Williams. So it's, it's, the, uh, the, it's the answer to the question, is there anything new in sci-fi anymore? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, it was so yeah. based yeah. on a, yes, so there like, is. <laughs> so, like so many great movies, uh, this is based on a short story, not a full novel, called "Story of Your Life" by Ched, Ted Chiang. It's in a collection of uh, short stories that he wrote. And um, I'll give you the quick little IMDb summary: A linguist works with the military to communicate with alien life forms after twelve mysterious spacecraft appear around the world. So, basically, you have Amy Adams playing. A linguistics professor and scholar and published author, like one of the best on the earth, who gets the military finds her because they need the best linguist in the world to try to start communicating with the their particular spacecraft that has landed in the United States. She is a, an American citizen. Twelve are around the world total, and her and the person who is leading the uh, physics and math part of the communication the this calm team if you will played by jeremy renner i can't remember if his character ian is his name i believe um and they build a relationship with these life forms on these spacecraft and eventually shit starts hitting the fan because humans start acting like humans and you have to learn some big lessons about about working together so there i know what you mean dave Mm. i kind of want to pick that apart just a second the uh is there anything new in sci-fi 
What did you What did you mean by that? Because I think I know what you mean in terms of application. There are some the themes we've seen these themes used before, but why is this movie so special? Why is the story so special? Yeah, I I I don't know. It's a, it could be like the slightly nonlinear way that it's it's done. Um, it's a novel idea that hasn't really been done before uh, in a mm -hmm. genre that has stories that have been done to death. It's mm -hmm. it's just like they came at it from such an original perspective. It was it turned it into something new. And on this, top of that, yeah, on dude. top of that, like it's beautifully shot, impeccably designed, it's perfectly paced. It features phenomenal performances from everyone involved. And uh, gushing, you know, gushing. Yeah, okay, fine, gushing. fine, yeah, baby. fine. Let's gush it up, dude. That's a gush about, alarm. I know I'm about to open another beer. This was my favorite movie of 2016. Keep going, though. I want to hear what else you had to say. Well, it's... Um, it's almost like like Villano can do no wrong here. He's got, like, prisoners. Sicario with Deacons, my favorite Sicario's cinematographer. Awesome. Like, the guy's so a fucking awesome. superhero. Then Arrival, then Blade Runner 2049 again with Deacons. Yep. And now Dune is coming out at the yeah. end of the year, hopefully. Uh, probably at the same time as... Uh, Christopher Nolan's and film. even before that, if you haven't seen Tenet, his, we have uh, to mention Tenet once the per episode. That's our <laughs> content. We're, we're going to talk about it till it comes out. And even before that, remember the other week I mentioned I saw Enemy, the one with Jake Gyllenhaal after Prisoners. Yeah. And, and mm. if no one has seen Incendies, which is his first like big yeah. movie that really took off in 2008, crazy, crazy drama, just classic Villeneuve. Why is this guy so good? What, what, what speaks to you so much about him? I've, I think about him quite a lot just because I feel like he's so popular right now and he's dominating the big movie scene. Like, I mean, why I, is he I doing read, that? I read some of the stuff um, and it's just, I think it's the level of detail he goes into. Like, he is designing this down to a molecular level. Like, yeah. the, the language, they designed a language. They had 130 something characters for the language or like images for the language that the aliens used. They used about 70 of them in the film but they designed an entire language. Like the programming code that they used to transform the language is scientifically accurate. Like the guy who invented the code that they used is an actual guy. And he has gone on record saying the code that the version of the code they used would have done exactly what they said it did. Holy so shit. it's, it's like, it's scientifically accurate. They made sure to make it as, you know, as close as possible to reality in a science fiction movie. And you, you just like, that's a level of detail that sci-fi doesn't, dabble with a lot yeah i also and think i has, feel like uh, that's something he brings to the party and everything he does it's like everything is it's it's sicario. like when you we didn't mention yeah, sicario. Oh, sicario holy hell yeah <laughs> uh no i, I did uh, earlier on but yeah oh, sorry, sicario sorry. is a phenomenal film and again it's it's something that's so simple but the level of detail that he brings to it he's able to draw these fantastic performances from people and i, I think it's yeah it's it's like his worth work ethic and the amount of like work that he puts into preparing for what this is going to look like that really yeah. does it. I'll gush myself. That's a gush alarm. No, that's great. Do it, yeah. dude. I've heard him talk about, um, I've heard him talk some about Arrival. It's, it seems to be the least that he's talked about the most because mm. right with scheduling, right after he did Arrival, he went immediately into pre-production for Blade Runner. Yeah. So I've heard him talk a lot about his experience with doing those two movies together and how he just like didn't sleep for like five years. Um, but Roger Deakins and him for Blade Runner, just I think it'll yeah. set us up for the arrival conversation. They basically came, uh, found a hotel and lived together outside of Toronto or wherever he's set up. And they stayed there basically in the same rooms for over three or four months, just figuring out how they wanted to, how to storyboard the entire thing. And that was before they got into specifics and design and stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, I totally agree with you. How, how, he is. What was their family life like during those three months? <laughs> Non-existent. Roger Deacon said yeah. he, he left his he, he left his wife. Like you know, like during that time, he didn't I mean, go back for visits. Should we really together. honor that she with is, Oscar? But, uh, no, the thing is, no, she is usually on set with him um, because she handles uh, like uh, they have a podcast now. Um, Roger Deakins has a podcast, and they uh, they Shout out to Roger like, Deakins she, podcast. That's awesome. Yeah, right. He <laughs> That's um, cool. it is it's amazing. Uh, they also did a lot of interviews when the pandemic first started and they kind of couldn't leave the house. So they wow. started doing like Zoom interviews with people and just chatting and sitting there for an hour, two hours and oh, shooting I'm the shit. To that. And some of the oh, <laughs> there's they're all over the place. Look them up. They're they're oh god, it's worth it. But she kind of goes and handles when they work together on set. They're a team. So like she will handle the set people, like as in she'll go and deal with like issues that come up with people and stuff and just leave him for the technical details. 
So he yeah. handles the finite details that he wants to get in the shot and stuff. But this this is not about him. We've got off track. Uh, the cinematographer uh, of Arrival, Bradley Brad Bradford Young. Bradford Young, sorry. Yeah. Have a look at his IMDb page. Holy shit, you will not find a more diverse body of work on that thing. Okay. Like, it's there. music videos from, like, so many artists. And then he goes on to feature films like Selma, Solo, yep. A Star Wars okay. Story. The Netflix yeah. series When They See Us. I mean, just in 2009, he had 11 fucking projects. And, and I cannot wait to see William. what he's doing next. Like, you know. Um, also, by the way, the first African American to be nominated for an Oscar in cinematography Jesus in 2016. Jesus That's Christ. five per year for like 80 years. And then wasn't, that, wasn't, the first, wasn't the first woman for Mud last year or two years yeah, ago? Uh, not last year, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, ridiculous. So, so the year after this, okay. That's yeah, ridiculous. get your okay. shit together, Academy. But yeah, okay. Uh, well, not I even mean, just the Academy producers. What is it? It's like we 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 give directors because they're visionaries and we give them money. But as far as people who are the cinematographers, they're the ones setting up the shots. They're the ones who come up with the look in many yeah. in many cases for everything. And we only trust the white dudes from film schools. Let's be real. That is the film school category. Is the cinematographer. Yeah. All right, so let's anyway, talk sorry, about. Sorry, we can, we can move on. Yeah, go ahead. This movie, yeah. dude, let's talk about Arrival. So why does why does why did Denny's Denny Villeneuve's vision and style work so well for this? I was I'm going to reference like the Ron Howard uh, masterclass thing because uh, he said something universal. It's not Ron Howard. He doesn't have a uh, claim over this, but he was talking about how in especially with this medium and just storytelling in general, it helps if there is a bit of mystery in everything. Oh yeah, what Denny Villeneuve does better than anyone else right now, I think, is he has, for lack of a better word, there is a noir quality to everything he does tonally. You do not know who and what you can trust completely in any of his movies. You have to That's get true. there with them as they learn to trust themselves. Almost all of his characters have that that inner doubt or conflict. So I wanted to get at that, that, that out because I think to pull that off, especially when you're dealing with sci-fi and fantasy, the performances in this movie are super grounded. I mean, they're, they're oh, ta- yeah. they take it just as seriously as any of the other adult dramas that came out this year or any other year. Amy Adams is subtle, has both feet firmly on the fucking ground. Yep. And you just completely believe everything that's happening to these people. It is not heightened. There is never a single moment where you're having, quote, fun, like, like a... I'm not, not, this is not a negative, but if Ridley Scott would have made this movie, it would have been more fun. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Versus like, this is feeling like you're a little nervous or anxious or scared for everyone the entire time. It does not yeah. let you go up through the final moment. And right? I mean, AD, Amy Adams as well snubbed for an Oscar that year as if we haven't given you enough reasons to hate them. Yeah. I mean, this, I, this whole thing was not treated the yeah. way I think it should have it been. It was it's ignored. It has the stig- stigma against it from being sci-fi, and I think this—I yeah. really do think this was the best movie of the year. No, no hate, no hate on Moonlight and La Land. I like both of those movies a lot. I loved, I loved. I like Moonlight. I, I really <laughs> did love those movies, but I have seen this one at least one other time since it came out. I think I showed my parents this movie a couple of years ago. Um, let's talk about this really fast. I wanted to ask you guys your opinion on this though, because so Martin Scorsese always says that he did not understand what this medium actually did. He had that teacher at NYU who, before it was like an actual film school, but it was like a mentor person who was running the film program that was like this fledgling thing that these kids were starting with this guy. And he used to always tell them, you will not understand the point of this medium until you understand the value of a shot. And you understand the value of a shot when it is in context. You will finally understand what the moving image can do in context with other moving images. This movie is a masterclass in editing, in storytelling for this medium. It oh, yeah. shows you what is possible with the, the, the way that movies can be very dreamlike, obviously something real general like that, but also in terms of pacing, the way he takes you in and out of gigantic sequences. That last sequence is like a 30 minute sequence. And it, it, it would not even come close to touching where it touches emotionally if you if you didn't have an editor, and I guess him, I'm sure he was heavily involved, with I understanding mean, the, how, where, the how to structure the flashbacks, the flashbacks, flash forward, mm. flashback things. 
and the storyboards, but I'm curious if they edited it, if they had every single shot storyboarded for the edit that way. I know, I'm sure they had plenty of the coverages most, in the- Most likely. It's, it's cr- most, I mean, It's most maybe, likely they, they really, yeah. Like they, like feature films at this level do animatics as well. So you'll get an animated version of the storyboard. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, and I totally agree with that. Although I have heard him say before that he's wary of those things because he had to confront that for the first time, he said, in uh, Blade Runner. And mm-hmm. obviously he made peace okay. with it and it had to be done. The way, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. So I'm not going to make I guess in a more, gra- the way guess in a more grounded edited. film like Arrival, yeah, they, maybe they didn't. But like, yeah, for Blade Runner, where you got so much visual effects, you definitely need an animatic. And you're just not sure, like when you're trying to mm. toll that line, like until you're actually sitting in the, well, when you're sitting I mean, down and you're actually cutting it, what is going to make us feel like she is slowly slipping into finally. Oh, that's definitely an editor. It. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. an editor. But like the storyboards are a guide for shooting. For the sure, editor for sure, for sure. will use it as a reference and then make it their own. So yeah, you're right. Phenomenal. Jeff, get in there, well. dude. What do, yeah. do you love, Jeff, do you love this it. movie? Um, yeah, of course. Get the fuck out of here. You, you asshole, do I love this movie? Try to prop me up in front of our fans here. You're movie. just trying to pit me out. Fuck you for um, asking. Yes, I've seen it twice. <laughs> I, I will stand for two things. Number one, um, I said this incorrectly. Stan is usually something you praise. I will knock two things. Number one, there are some cheesy lines. You can't escape it. There are some cheesy lines. I'm waiting for a buzz. Dave's being very, very kind to me. I'm being generous the there. Oh, I'm being generous there. But there are. So for instance, when they first meet, so as we said at the beginning, um, she is a linguistics professor and on Forrest Whitaker, who is basically is a, works for the government and is trying to, because she still has the clearance, is trying to recruit her to come and interact with these alien be- beings who are, they look like octopods, octopuses, but they only have seven legs. So they're heptopods, which is also kind of cheesy, but at the same time, they pull it off. They pull that off. Really, really well. Okay, fine. They pull that <laughs> off. Well, but when he recruits her, when he tries to recruit her, she knows he's going to go for an, a, a, a rival professor at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And she goes, ask him what the Arabic word is for war. And, and it's like a cool moment the first time you see it, but ultimately it's like a Farsi. little cheesy. And then, no, Farsi, it, sorry, uh, Sanskrit, sorry. Sanskrit, Sanskrit. Who gives a shit? It doesn't matter. It's cheesy. And then when they get on the... Because <laughs> yeah. it's not spoken. It does matter because it's not spoken. It's drawn. It's Sanskrit. And when Keep she going. gets... It, yeah, but they don't say that in the film. Instead, it's just this weak line like, you should hire me because of this. And I was like, we can do better than that for her. And then um, when they get on the helicopter, which is, you know, okay, fine. That's cheesy because they need to rush things along. That helicopter landing sequence to get her on the helicopter is really fucking cool. At night, she lives on a lake and the sky just lights up because this helicopter's coming. And it's an alien movie. So they tease you. It kind of looks like a UFO is coming to town, just like it's straight out of Close Encounters. But um, she gets on the helicopter and Jeremy Renner's there on the comms. So they're talking on the comms. And she was like, the basis of, of civilization is language. And he goes, no, the basis for cinematography. Fuck. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. 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 Something yeah. stupid. <laughs> uh-huh. The basis for civilization is language. And he goes, the basis for civilization is science. And then Forrest Whitaker goes, that's why we hired both of you. And that's cheesy as fuck. So, I, as far as what I, no, no, no. So, wait. <laughs> Those are not so, the cheesiest ones in my mind. I thought you were going to go for some of the latter romantic lines this is, at the this end. Is, this the is the most lines lines we had in, in the first end. segment. The romantic lines that I don't, but the funny thing is, is that it, it, it's coming across like I don't love this film. I do Jeff love this arrival. film. In fact, Jeff, oh my God. Um, he's, he's anti alien. They're. <laughs> I'm sticking up for the Academy on this one because this is not Fuck an Oscar winner for best picture. Sorry. Also, there there is um, there is stuff where you question, and this this is the part that I actually love that I would would be interested to talk about. I don't want to spoil this movie too much, but I didn't know how I would approach this conversation. I think but... we should spoil it. This is a really popular movie. I don't spoilers. Okay, here we come. Like let's just. They're do not it. flashbacks. They're flash right. forwards. So as soon as you realize that in when we saw it in the theater, I believe I saw this with you, John. Um, when we saw this in the theater, it's so fucking, it's a great, it's like Lost, when all of a sudden Lost is doing flash forwards, and you're like, oh my god, it's actually in forward the whole time, and she can see the past, oh my god, that's so great, but when you think about it for a second, you're like, okay, so does the future become a self-fulfilling prophecy, and ultimately, you have that game with yourself, by you, I mean me, I'm having this game with myself, and I was like, why is she so surprised in the future, and the truth is, it's because the future and the past are happening at the exact same time, 
Now, how to explain that? I don't really know, but it, but I they pulled that off really well. I think. I think they pulled yeah. it off really, really, really well. But it, you, whenever you do something like this, we talked about Back to the Future with the the crisscrossing timelines. Mm. This, as soon as you go into time in, into the future, and then you, now you're in the pre- the present is in the past, and then the future is now. You, oh you, no! You I've gone cross-eyed. Help. You can't help but start asking yourself <laughs> questions. And ultimately, I think they pulled it off. For instance, you're right. That last montage is really, really nice. But then you start asking, wow, she's really touching Jeremy Renner's neck really sensually. I know they're together in the future, but he doesn't know that. Why is he treating this so well? And and unfortunately for this film, as much as I love the rewatch, 95% of it is more interesting on the rewatch. I loved more the way they approached treating the aliens. I loved more the way they start de- deciphering the language and they start breaking down how to communicate with these beings. I actually loved more how she apparently was given psychic powers by the aliens, which is something that isn't really explained, but it doesn't really have to be necessarily, That which sci-fi yeah. does this. We don't know why she can see in the future, but nobody else can. There are 12 of these things. Why is she the only one in the world who can see into the future simply by looking at a picture of a circle and understanding their language? She now understands the way they think, so she now understands how time works differently, so therefore her time starts working differently, so therefore she can see in the future? That still seems like a little bit of a jump, and ultimately I think they pull it off, but there are a few times where you cannot help in a rewatch question does she why is she the only one and i don't know if they answer that and again they don't necessarily have to but for me that makes this a nine and not a ten that's what i would say nine's still pretty damn good why is she no, the I, only I, one I, yeah no i know what you mean. I, I i agree i agree but why is it why can't jeremy renner see in the future he's there and he's trying to decipher these things too. oh he doesn't understand but he's them. not okay. a, but, but he's not a linguistic Oh he my god, he's a scientist. Way. He's a scientist, right. and yeah, ask your so, dad. He's the so, science guy. So straight Cheesy. up, his statement yeah. is wrong. Scientist. No, I did think. No, it was interesting. I'm, I'm learning another language right and now. And I'm that fine with that. I'm, I'm just doing... curious why she has the power and nobody else I mean, does. Please, and nobody take that argument. Giver. Everyone respects science and listen to your scientists. No, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. No, but I do think it's the. I mean, that is the entire. Like, if that failed for you, then the. I, I, I understand it how it would be. It didn't fail for me. It just, I, I can't help but have the question pop up into my head. Yeah, but I, I mean, mean that, but that, his, that is the question that. of the entire movie. Yeah, if the, that, the language has to retrain how you think. That, that is the entire premise. Yeah. She's susceptible to that. I mean, yes, that's, that's how the, the aliens yeah. experience all right, so time I, it's, all at once. And all right. by, in, by teaching their language, uh, she's now able to experience time all at once. So I am... I'm learning yeah. another language right now, so I was no, thinking I, I, they, about they this said stuff that in the while film. I was, what you, what are you I was learning? experiencing that. I'm learning yeah. Turkish. Uh, my father's from Turkey, and yeah, that's, he didn't learn I, it growing yeah. up, so I'm learning it. So I was thinking about this stuff, because I've been talking about this with friends who speak other languages during this time while I'm learning it. It's weird how it is messing. Remember that her weird dream when he says, are you dreaming of them? And she looks over, and she sees that bot in her room. Hmm. Remember that scene? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a nightmare she's having. Yeah. So a, um, yeah, you do start really to dream cool, actually, to in other languages and you do start to think yes. differently because conjugation yeah. of certain, you know, syntax makes you makes you actually think differently about how you construct intent, like the reason you were speaking. Right. Anyway, Jeff, I can't remember if you and I saw this together because I know I saw it with our other roommate, Al. I think the three of us saw it together. Okay. I did not so, see this alone. It's been a while, since, about that. It's been a while since you shouted that out. Now. Hold on, wait. So what was interesting <laughs> about that is that I remember, this is why this movie is still so great to me. Because I, I, I respect everything you're saying. I'm not going to disagree with it. But I remember Al and I saw that for sure. I can't remember if you were there. And our, our friend Al's father is a linguistic professor. Yeah. He speaks five fluent languages and is basically, you know, he's one of those people no, who's I remember been this. Yeah. doing this for so long that he can pretty much understand most languages if you give him enough time. So he's kind of like this Amy Adams character. He understands language Mm. well enough to approach any language. And I remember Al talking about how his father used to talk to him about this fact, that learning these other languages, and then eventually when you get to a place where you understand language well enough, how it does shift the way you think about thinking. I know they say that in the film. You're, you're not. So you're hold like, on, okay. hold on, hold on. My so only reason, point is, on, how can you on, see on. the future? That doesn't mean you're a psychic. I know I what you mean. Did they how say did it in you? The movie how did you like times. this movie? Because I feel like you completely. If you didn't like this, you didn't like the movie. This is the movie, dude. This is exactly. I like what she this movie at 
at a nine. And I love that she goes at for me, I just don't think they explained it. And they just said, Well, you figure it out. And I I, I wish that How can I you explain you- something that is literally embedded in another language? It is the weapon, it is the technology, it is the whole thing they a gave her. A language can't help you see the future. Read the book she wrote. That's apparently that's the other way we'll find out because it's not supposed to tell you that. We're not supposed to know how she knows no, you're that right. other than that she th- learns the language. It just sounds like it bothered you. It's another All Toy I'm Story situation. In my head. <laughs> no, it's just because we're having this conversation. If we never had this podcast, I would have never brought up this thought. I wouldn't have said anything to a goddamn person unless like a friend who was a nuclear physicist talked about it as their favorite movie ever. I was like, okay, can you explain so, to so me tell this? Me, tell me one more time. I think I... You said you en- you think you enjoyed it more the first time around or more on No, the- I enjoyed it more this time. That's the yeah. funny thing. I yeah. love this movie and I loved it even more the second time. On the rewatch, all I'm saying it really holds is, up. All I'm saying is there I but I, I know that I, I'm not gonna get this answered in a third watch. And I know that's okay. I know that's sort of the point perhaps of the director. It's like you're never gonna know. Read the and book. You can tell me. You can tell me a million times that that understanding a different language. You dream in that language, and you start thinking it differently. That doesn't mean that you can see the future. As soon as she meets these 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 aliens, she can see the future, and that has to be. The, the, I'm just. I don't know. I, I don't know. But isn't it That's the it. same? Hold on. Wait, is, let's let's go there with the sci-fi stuff. Isn't it that same theory? What's that rule that um, time travel will have always existed if it ever existed? Isn't that like the sci-fi thing? So sure. if, as soon as it de- she it depends meets on the them, sci-fi, it depends on the sci-fi. But as right. soon as she yeah. meets them line- in a chronological way within our, within this movie, what we don't know yeah. yet is that she has already been inside the ship with them and that had that experience, the intimate one with them, right. where maybe that was where she actually yeah. absorbed it, where she has the personal conversation with Abbott or whatever Casella or whatever that other one was. Those so, are the names yes. of the heptapod aliens, Abbott. And yeah, Costello. those are yeah. Abbott and Costella. So. Yeah, I know what you mean. You're right. I feel like it. I feel like it doesn't matter because it's, if that rule is followed, then we have to assume that they follow the rule well. They do. Yeah, and it I just mean, feels and weird because you can't that understand. Is, it. That, I mean, that is good writing. You set up the rules of your of your world and you stick to those rules. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No, do, I, how I, I completely agree. The, how powerful is the is the opening? I, I, I was trying to think in this rewatch. Everything's I was trying powerful. To think, do, do, you don't have to sell this movie to me. I think this movie yeah. is fantastic. No, I, know, I think. I, know, I think I know. we. Just say that I think we all agree on this movie. This movie is awesome. Everyone should watch yeah. this movie. It Let's take really, a one shot out. It it knocks down the like the preconceptions about sci fi. Um, it is not I your agree. normal sci fi movie. I think almost anyone will enjoy this. And there are the music sequences too. that are the music mind too. Blo- yes. Turn the music all the way up this when they is, go up uh, the first time. So this is, the, it's, the it's helicopter like, land. Like, there are some amazing. Yeah. Max it's like, Richter, it's, Max it's like two thousand and one. The the only way to watch it is loud. Yeah, it's great. Max yeah. Richter yeah. opens and closes this movie with it on the nature of daylight, which is like that super popular thing that gets used all the movies. This is probably the best time I think it's ever used. And Johan Johansson, who Johan sadly Johansson, passed your away, boy. sadly yeah. passed away. This was his second time. He did Prisoners for him as well. Uh, third time. He did mm. Sicario, Prisoners, and this. And I thought, what a unique, weird fucking score yeah. he does with those vocals and everything. This movie is very special. Yeah, it is pretty good. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the he test. He got snubbed, which proves the Oscars I think that's the test. This last thing I'll say. I think that's the test about movies, Jeff. I totally agree with you. When I walked out of this theater, I remember we had, we had that conversation with Al and stuff. I didn't really remember the bits and pieces of the movie. It was dreamlike. Same. The whole thing the end, stood though. with me, and the subject yeah. matter kept marinating. And every time I've watched it since then, I've enjoyed the actual movie more and more. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. taste of a good film, right? You just it's the, endlessly the third time I watch it. Yeah. The third time I watch it, I'm gonna put these questions off to the side because I've already asked them and I don't give a shit about them anymore. And I'm gonna it's gonna <laughs> be a ten out of fucking ten. I promise that's it. Fun, well, on that dude. note, we should wrap this up. Yeah. That was fun. Arrival, go listen to Johan Johansson. So yeah, everybody go and watch this movie. Like get get hold of it. it it's uh, at the moment uh, Sorry. at the moment it's only a rental, it's not on streaming services, I believe. I think that's correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. This one might be worth the purchase, folks. Get in there. It's a great it is. It is yeah. definitely worth awesome. the purchase. All right. We got to move on. This is a longer segment, we'll but back. it was worth it. Okay. The Witch. We're back. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Is that a crow saying we're back? Speaking of a crow, noise. we are going to talk about the witch. 
A witch. She's a witch. It was the crow. It was the crow eating my nipple. I'm sorry. I'm the mom of the witch. You like my random reference there? That was random, not random, Dave. Everything is always, always weird. This man likes dark birds. (laughs) So we're going to be talking about the witch. Now, this is the film year of 2016. If you go to IMDb, which I have open here on my computer, it'll say the witch 2015, and you're going to sit there and you're going to go, well, gee, I thought this film was from 2016. Well. It did no, the we festival. Didn't. It did the festival circuit in 2015, but its official U.S. release, were, especially like to theaters, were like where yes, and humans as anybody could knows, it, the festival, festival circuit. Was, the festival circuit counts for nothing. <laughs> That's right. It was the 19th, the 19th of February, 2016. Really funny what happened to um, uh, Valentine's Day. First, it was like a good day to die hard comes out on Valentine's Day, and then Deadpool comes out on De- Valentine's Day. And you know what came out the same day as Deadpool? Dave is the witch. Actually, no, yeah. no, no. This actually came out the week after, but basically the same idea. So, um, you know, which I, one heard, I, went I think and I saw Deadpool. this with you, because <laughs> we had heard that. <laughs> Dave, um, we had heard that. <laughs> We, that's funny you fucking dick. we're about to talk about this movie that we're trying to encourage people to watch it Jim. um we had heard that steve we had heard that we had heard that stephen king loved the witch and it, it was uh it did, it did really well at sundance and uh, apparently like because this happened to get out and then us like horror movies do well in january february when everybody's shut in basically and they have to go home and like get under their covers horror mil- movies do really well in the early of the year mm, this yeah. this is like what would I call this? A psychological thriller based in religious lore that is also horrifying. I mean, he. I don't he, know the what subtitle, genre would you put the sub, this in. The, the the subtitle of this is a New England folktale. Yeah, yeah it is. Like it but is. it's a fucking yeah. It's a German folktale though. It's one of those ones where you're like, oh, and the Little Mermaid, she just became one of the ghost people at the end. It's like one of those weird ass like. It's a German folklore is folktale yeah. is what I would say. But it's, it's like, in America. I'm I'm gonna come and take you into the forest and eat your face. That's a German folktale oh basically. God. It's like <laughs> all right. We're getting we're getting long winded. I apologize. So what what this is about is it is about a 17th century family, specifically in 1630s who is born in England and decided Ah, to come over here. They decided to come over here to New England, Northern United States for a better life. And they get kicked out of the community they're in in New England. (laughs) It was was a bad idea then. It's a bad idea now. Because (laughs) don't come here. Don't don't do it. Don't do it. Um, Because their religious interpretation of the Bible was a little bit different than the town that they tried to settle in. So they were banished shed from the town. They were too intense and they were, for the Puritans. They were too <laughs> intense for the Puritans. Came over with. Yeah. Every yes, fucking gotta, thing I'm, about their yeah. day in life, they have to pray before like, they shit, think. Shit, is, Joe, oh you're God. too religious. Yeah. You've got to go. But uh, honestly, thanks to the language, it, it almost sounds borderline Shakespearean, but they, they according yeah. to according to the, the writer, director, producer, whatever, they... They used actual transcripts from the Salem witch trials, and they used that language as their basis for their dialogue. So some of the dialogue, hmm. according to them, came directly from these transcripts. Um, so thou hast speaketh, you know, they actually kind of talk like that a little bit, which helps because honestly, like the r- religious part of this is, which is the whole movie basically is really, really, it takes a second to get used to. I'll put it that way. They're, I mean, they're, they're praying for everything, and they're like, if you don't pray, if you laugh, then you are a sinner because of pride, and you need to pray that away. And if you don't, then you're going to have the devil get inside of you and be turned into a witch. Or like, there's there's some kind of that ideology going on in this. Yeah, I can, but I can tell you, short, like, the family given, goes given, into the fucking shitter. Given the language structure, like, if you're, if you're watching this at home, don't run the dishwasher at the same time. You want to understand a fucking word they say. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch it with subtitles, to be honest with you. Okay, um, but anyway... I think in one of the storyline things, they were like, it's a portrait of a family unraveling with their own sins. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's so funny. The, the trailer family. of this. They, they never stood a fucking chance. The, the trailer of this is <laughs> awesome because it's Anya, Anya Taylor Johnson. I, why, why do I say Joy. Anya, Taylor, Anya Joy. Taylor Joy? Sorry, sorry, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Anya Taylor Joy, who, by the way, is the next big thing. She just had Emma come out this year right before quarantine. What is up with people getting their big break ruined? So anyway, yeah, yeah. um, 
She said other good movies. No, she's had a big break. Cooked. Like New, she, Mut- New Mutants is going to come out New and change the game play, yeah. uh, sometime in like 2025. Yeah. She's like 24. I think she was in you'd... Split this year as well. She was mm-hmm. in Split, exactly right. And split, the other one. Uh, split and um, Glass? Glass, yeah. She was the older out of the two girls. Um, so yes. anyway, um, she's the lead of this movie. Um, she's a teenager. She's the oldest out of the children of this family. And I the feel like trailer this was a breakout. This was a breakout. This was definitely role. a breakout. It was a huge, yeah. yeah. So the trailer is she's playing peekaboo with a baby. It's a it's a baby boy who's maybe three months old tops, and they're outside. Yeah. Phenomenal again. acting performance from that baby. P- thank that baby nailed it. Puritanical New England, right? Salem witch trials era, and she's playing peekaboo with the baby, and she closes her eyes and opens her eyes, and the baby's gone. And she looks up, and there's just like this wind trail that leads into the woods. And so we're to believe that those demon spirits or something going on that's going on in the woods. I will say we shouldn't spoil the movie too much, but early on in the movie, there's a there's some lady that lives in the woods. Now, if I lived in the woods by myself in 1630, I'd probably be a witch too. You know, I don't know if I'd have powers, but I would certainly look like this weird ass person does. Um, but yes, let's just say they're in a very dangerous, delicate place. I'm and now picturing you like that, and it's not pretty. I mean, is it in this film? Like, <laughs> no, it's not. Anyway, I don't know how to set it up, but it, some, it is I mean, really cool. Some, some of them are. There, there is more than one. Right. The, like, it's very bare bones. Like, yeah. Not a lot of spe- not a lot of special effects, as far as I know. It is. Mm. It's just a little psychological. No. And also, I think we have to say. Sorry, I'm getting chatty. If you've ever seen Game of Thrones, Lysa Aaron, who is Catelyn Tully's sister. This is getting wordy. It's the one who breastfeeds a nine-year-old, all right? The one who, like, yeah. gets thrown through the moon door because she breastfeeds a nine-year-old. Let's just say that would be the PG version of this movie. Like, she does weirder shit than that in this movie. <laughs> she is the mother of yes. this family. A crow eats her nipple, as we were talking about at the beginning of this segment. Really, really awesome, terrifying performance from her as well. Who wants to get started after that weird-ass setup I just gave you? I'll go. I mean, go I I love like this whole thing. Like they, it doesn't lose you in. It's like it starts with them getting kicked out of the commune and such. Yeah. Like they they're out of the village and they find the place to live. And then it shows the place they're going to live. And it starts one of those omen exorcist slow zoom in with the like the choral soundtrack escalating. It's it's like a, it's a horror trope of old, and it's it was used so well just to set up the fact that okay, you might have made a fucking bad decision by camping out here, and like like we said, it's Anya Taylor Joy in a breakout role. Harvey Scrimshaw, the, the who plays the eldest son, yeah, for he's me, great. For me, was a phenomenal performance. Like he underplays it at the beginning, and then when he has his experience with the forest and comes back that whole last scene that he gets is just an amazing performance from a kid this this guy is one to watch but yeah the kids uh, keep, the kids in yeah, general are if, really if, good. if he all of them are really great if he can like if they keep going like keep watch these kids they are phenomenal in this yeah. film it, it helps mm-hmm. to sell it a lot um it's a it's a really i oh, will warn you it's a slow beginning uh but when it it sets the scene it builds momentum it Definitely. builds ominously and but when things start to spiral it happens fast like shit goes downhill fast and, and this thing is tight like, it's like an hour 35 hour 30 yeah, yeah something like that. i love that yeah. i love that hour and 32 also, with credits yeah. just just yeah just a word out to anyone this is not a movie to watch when you're doing something else it needs your full attention put down your phone turn the lights down turn the sound up and just enjoy the journey it's a little hard like granted like jeff said earlier with the language it's a little hard to understand them sometimes uh i know we would turn the audio up and down a lot yeah um also great but, creepy music great creepy but music. yeah the music choice is phenomenal in this film yeah i mean this is uh yeah. brought down by the sin would you say that storyline was devoured by their sins or destroyed yeah, by their yeah. sins or something so this is like a classic story structure where because they're telling you early on with the tone and the music and everything you're saying that this was a bad idea for them yes. to move out into these woods. So this is one of those story structures that's been used a million times where we know early before they do, because we see what happens when the baby gets taken early in the movie. Uh, so this is that classic structure where you're seeing 
characters figure out what you, the audience, already knows. And it, the, I, I feel like for me, it lands mm. because by the time it gets to about two-thirds of the way through, when most of the family is either acknowledging it or completely accepting it and they're terrified from it, you feel trapped with them. There's no mm. way they're going to get out of this situation. Also, so fair, like, fair warning to anyone who's going to watch it. This is this is a film that is not afraid to go there. No, it's like not. Like my wife was horrified. Somebody with the, touches the, the, the baby first, in a the very first inappropriate witch scene. Way. Like yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. It, it like it is it is going to shock you. It is going to like you're going to be it's very disturbing. Yeah, it's very yeah. disturbing. Um, I really enjoy the stuff. I know what you mean. You don't want to spoil it, but I feel like we have to talk about some details. So, like, obviously, when any with any classic witch tale, Satan has to be involved somehow directly. It's usually yeah. not witches independently yeah. operating. It's it's that old witch allegory of them actually being his one of his his minions and having sold their soul to him and signed his book. Yeah. And they they fall into all those tropes and they really literally follow them. So Satan's a character. Like, in dude, this even movie. the goat, even the goat gave a phenomenal performance, and the, he is he comes in yes. the shape of yeah. a goat, and a black goat is, goes... is is historical lore, by the way, that it's usually a sign of the devil. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. I've summoned him once or twice. Black Philip. So I, I, I don't know. I feel like uh, Phillip, man. <laughs> Robert Robert Eggers is the director and writer of this, and he made The Lighthouse this past year. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'm every I've seen both these movies in the theaters now. And they are not for everybody. Like he is a very, he's like an alter like style director, but I am so thankful that someone like that has a voice in the horror genre, because this is not going to pop out and scare you throwing popcorn around in the theater. Jeff and I saw this with probably like maybe 10 or 15, 20 people maximum. It was a small house in a regular Mm -hmm. size theater. And there was not a fucking word spoken on the way out or during the screening. Everyone else was watching Deadpool. No. <laughs> yeah. I no, just remember the asking, like, did they curse the baby's balls? Was that part of the witch's incantation? That she it was, was really doing? confusing. Yeah. That was touching weird. the baby before and then she thought, starts cutting it. They put their actors through some stuff where you're watching this and you're like, and by actors, sometimes that includes children who are very young in, into some stuff. Not, not, they're not getting naked or anything, but like the, the actors really feel like they are from that time and they're living it. It feels like the, the color of their fingernails was earned and it wasn't painted in a way, you know, it was like, uh, the, the dad, um, his name is, uh, Ralph Innocent, who was a great joy in the second season of game of Thrones. He's, uh, in ready player one as like the dad or the father-in-law he, he's in stuff. You'd probably recognize him. He's in guardians of the galaxy, Dave mm-hmm. shout out. Um, he's awesome. And yeah, you, like you could tell that they're just there. Like it's, it, it almost seems, it almost seems like, um, it it almost seems like they're going too far as as actors, and and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it it leads to it. It's yeah, very believable. There, there what is not doing. a single point in this movie where you don't believe 100 yeah. percent they are religious, right. religious it's zealots. Like, you know when you see a TV show and they're like set in this time period, and you're like, bro, you weigh like 280 pounds of pure muscle. Like, come on, you, nobody has that much protein in 19 in 1630. You know what I mean? And you watch these people go through it, and you're like, this is believable. They haven't eaten anything mm-hmm. but corn. Yeah, in, in, it just in hasn't two years. eaten anything in so long. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think? All right, so let's get a little critical here. I, I kind of, I was trying, and I went into this rewatch remembering that I had some issues with the ending. How do you guys feel about the ending? Do you think it needed to go all the way to showing you, spoiler alert, to showing you her going to the fire? Yeah, being I loved led it. By I, ne- I needed it. It, it was it a release for did, me because. The I I feel like the whole point of the movie was that it was like the devil was after her. Yeah, it's because the whole there's, yeah, a, com- the same there's, way. there's a commune the same way. in the forest, yeah. so that needed her her corruption and eventually downfall need, needed to be shown. There's a piece of me that wishes that I feel like because this happened again to me this time. There there was something that landed really hard because you feel again that that trap thing I was talking about, like how they were all trapped, and then. They all get picked off, basically, except except for her, folks. Like, go watch this movie. So everyone gets devoured by the sins. So she's eventually. We, we, yeah, we haven't actually we haven't actually said who she is, but so that's good. 
she, yeah, so someone she, so is the last the, last person standing. Maybe the girl we were talking about earlier, but we were so at some point you feel trapped. It's kind of like a haunted house tale, honestly. You feel isolated in mm. this situation, and then eventually she's completely alone. And yeah. that it, this it movie follows, landed, it does follow the it follows the familiar trope of the horror film with the last girl. Yeah, so it, that but in, that, it, then I remember turns, feeling this then way. It, then in it the turns theater. that on its head. So that's what I'm saying, though. I remember yeah. in the theater, it, it did the same thing to me, and it landed the same way for me this time. When she was finally alone, and she sits down at the table, and she just like puts her head down, I remember thinking, all right, here comes an epilogue, or the movie's over. Because emotionally, I'm that's there. Yeah. She's, she's yeah. done. So I, I feel like he, they, they, whoever was involved with this, they did such a good idea of, I mean, it's such a good job of enabling all the fear and suspicion and terrifying curious curious tone that comes out of the woods the way they filmed the woods up until this point it almost let me down a little bit again first time and again that she actually that we follow her all the way in i really there is a piece of me that wants this movie to end with her with or without black philip i don't really mind that she was kind of told this is what you need to do. But I kind of wanted her to just walk into the woods and we are still left on the outside, terrified of what happens to her inside. Cause I feel like I the movie so emotionally was already, already achieved. Like they got there. They did everything they needed to do to make me as scared as I'm going to be. Anything beyond that is might be telling me a little bit too much. Cause now I know what happened to her it's, as opposed to, it's a short was she thing the witch that, the whole time. Yeah. No, it finishes. It completes. She wasn't the witch the whole time. She no. wasn't until. And also, it sticks with the lore where she, she has to sign her name, witch, which is weird. Uh, there was yeah, no. Yeah, there, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. there was a. There was. It a was a release. Of she them, did like, it. She she still had to yeah. make the choice. She still had to make the choice, which was an obvious choice, perhaps. But she made the choice, and then we had, got a release yeah, as an audience went. that not only did, but it also wasn't like she did anything. She actually almost got taken away. She got like swept away by it, and she enjoyed it. She was happy okay. to do that. Here's, and I thought it was a great release thing. for me. Like I, I was sitting there, I was watching this with my wife, Therese, and uh, her when it got down to one, they narrowed it down to one, and she's like, okay, her mission now is to go into the forest and rescue her siblings. And that was the expectation she had from that point. And it was like, that is not ha- what is That's about to not, fucking happen. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, it literally subverted your expectations. Right. To, for right the ending. Talk, I feel, right, I feel right. like that was a good point. Okay, let's then let's keep going with it. Let's say because I, I didn't hate it. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't hate the ending by any means. I just I, I had kind of my own version of it in my head, and I still kind of felt like I wanted it that way. But if we're gonna go with what he did, I really did have some issues with him going to a close up for the ending because I felt like naked. that last that last master though, where it showed her pulling away from us and becoming a part of the group of those witches. I felt like it took something away from it a little bit that he tried to give that point of view back to me by showing her close up because she's it wasn't as scary. It was scarier to me when she was pulling away from us and she was. I don't think it was supposed to be them. scary at this point. We're with her. She's the point of view. We are getting swept into this. We're looking forward to it. We're excited. Why does it have to no, be I scary? Agree, at I the agree end? that I agree. The movie's that over. It, I, the movie's over. I, this is like a coda at the end because it could have been scary. <laughs> Because this is a horror movie and it could have We've been scarier scary. if he hadn't done it. All right. That. This is your arrival. And now we're just nitpicking and John wishes something. That doesn't make it good or bad. You just wished it was different. It You're not doesn't. saying it was I bad just... because it was the way it is. You just said you wish it was this way for personal reasons. I was just I asking mean, if I, you guys I, I, felt I, like it was, if it left you with anything, the, the, the ending landed for you perfectly. You didn't have any issues with it at all. In fact, the second I, time I, I couldn't like wait for it. In, in my like, opinion, it's a, it's, a, it's a slow beginning. That then comes into a spiraling descent that then in, ends very weirdly, but I feel like that was intentional. Yeah. I mean, the 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 last 10 minutes were all, well, I, I didn't say my ST. The last 10 minutes were all a little weird, but the last 90 seconds, it was, I enjoyed it because it was, I, I just, I wanted the release. Just give me that. It was, just give me yeah, something. it was like, oh shit, this is not going to go the way you want it to. Right. No, and no, I do no, think I, totally I do think I do think the close up was but probably think, practical yeah. because she it was, was naked. It was, I mean, it was the it was the Chinatown ending. But that's yeah, like, this is not going to end well to you. I'm, but yeah. no, no. But I, emotionally, I agree with you. But I'm literally talking about p- point of view stuff. This is technical. 
that last master before the close up, when she is still standing on the ground in front of the fire from way back, mm -hmm. we see her stand in front of them and they start floating up. I think he should have blacked out then because we knew she was going to start floating too. It just took something away from it when he cut into her point of view where it's like, we're not, we don't have her point of view, dude. We are not witches. To... This is terrifying <clears throat> that she is a part of this now. <laughs> I had to right, John, 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 you did, made, John, you made your point. I vehemently disagree. Yeah, I, I think as such, sure. I, but ultimately, it's the film he intended to make and it takes you on a journey and I feel like it, it ends the journey as... Journey's over. Yeah. Well, I actually couldn't believe they didn't ends, just say the witch it, at the end. It, cause, it yeah. ends the journey and not as you expect. I, To be honest, I wasn't paying attention to the shots at the end. I, it, I was just caught up in what was happening. Was this the first I, I time really you saw it? it? No. No. I, I really think it has to get practical. She's naked, and 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 so that's why there's a close up. I, I, you, you know, and it, she was and, yeah. and she was joy. This is the first time we've seen a character express joy since that first baby was was stolen, and I thought it was fun. That's, no, that's, that's a good fair. point. That's a good point. That is yeah, fair. that's a good point. That was the first time we saw anyone happy in this movie and, ever. And and, <laughs> and and let's talk about let's talk about John. Let's talk about, let's talk about. We don't need to talk about religion, but let's go for here. The only way she experiences joy was when she lets go of the weight of all of this. You have to pray if you laugh and, and oh, there's no core in me to pray harder. And it's like the only way that she's happy is if like, she, it's like the burden is the been devil is happy, her. dude. The devil is happy, dude. That's, that's what I'm he's not selling. saying <laughs> that. I'm not saying that. But I mean, that's what the movie is saying, though. I mean, let's be real. That, that girl the only did reason not I didn't buzz him is because I want... might be the devil. Would she you did like not to smile. live? Would you I like think the to only live other time she, Yeah, that's so good. That's a good line. I think the only other time she enjoyed herself was when she first pretended to be the witch when she was fucking with her little sister. So that's a good point. I think it was the exactly. only other time we saw yeah. her have any fun at all doing anything. Right. All right. It's a good movie, you guys. Laugh I was with a huge the sinners cry with the saints, John. Definitely like, turn, turn your lights yeah, out, Billy put your phone down, Joel. turn it off, and it's give fun. it a watch. Tell us what you think. Reach out to yeah. us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and soon YouTube. Reach out to us. We'd love to hear find us really anywhere. Fast. This movie was on Amazon forever because it's an A24, and now it's not. Now it's only on Netflix? Yes. Yeah. On Netflix, though. Okay. Go watch it. It's been on, yeah. it's been on Amazon for forever, though, because they usually go straight to Amazon. So take 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 a look while you still can. I don't know if that'll get sold out of Netflix at some point. Make sure you get a watch in. This thing is fucked up little, and disturbing. I watched this while. alone at a mountain house in the middle of the woods, and I I was a little scared. You guys, <laughs> I can I know I can vouch for how creepy that house in the woods is. I was yeah. a little nervous. That scene. Yeah. There's a really excellent scene. My favorite scare. Let's do this really fast. What was your favorite scare? Mine was definitely. When she was eating that fucking goat with the kids when they were locked inside, boarded up inside of that little barn, and they look oh, over yeah. and that the, bitch yeah, is yeah, eating the goat. Cool. No, my the biggest scare for me is when the father gets nailed. Ooh, yeah, Black mm, Phillip just that, right to the like, goat. dude. Seriously, I jumped and I broke out in goosebumps because I forgot that was fucking coming. Right, the first time was just a cinematography. And you will play. too. Don't Sorry, worry. <laughs> the first time was a cinematography play where you're you're following. It's the they only do once with her and then once yeah. with him where you're looking at them and they don't turn to see what they're looking at and then when they turn they turn from behind them so they're blocking the shot so you still don't get an unobstructed view of the shot i know that sounds really specific but anyway that really that was creepy it was basically like I mean, the et thing looking in the yeah, cornfield no, really, really cool. as stephen king says the the best thing is to not show what's happening don't show like, everything. Don't, so when yeah, you turn it around everything. so I see it, but it's still obstructed, is brilliant. Uh, this time, um, I would say it was, yes, John, to that point, because right before then is when the goat starts, which has the blood come out. So that whole sequence, for sure. All right. Yeah. So we need to move on because this is going to be our longest episode ever. Yeah. We liked it. these we, movies. We, yeah, we liked these, these movies. movies. Like X-Men Apocalypse movies. coming at you. All right. We're going to pick a new year. Oh, for our next it's episode. That time. I'm so excited. My, I'm I'm all tingly over here. I don't know about you guys. I've drank more, right, gushed I'm gonna, more. I'm going to hit the really dramatic noise. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> That was John's dramatic noise. Um, 1996. 1996. Oh, I'm excited. Oh, all right. that's going to be a good one. We're going to take a look at the movies of... There's Jeff. He's back. We're going to take a, movie, a look at the movies of 1996, and we're going to talk way longer 
then you have to wait for us to get back to you and we'll be right back yes also <laughs> um just just bear with it this is gonna be a long episode Please. We are back. We are back with our redemption film of the week. No, oh, what the fuck just happened? Anyway, at the oh, end yeah, of this so- segment, we are going to announce the three films that we are going to be discussing next week from the film year 1996, which, by the way, was a very good film year, especially 90s, when baby. it comes to rewatchability, which is our oh. specialty here on the Love of Cinema Pod. Tell your but, friends. Tell your friends. <laughs> Before we get to what we're going to be talking about next week, we got to finish up this week. And first, is it really that bad? Is it? Is it or was it? I'm messing up my tenses. Was, was it, it? Was it really, really that bad? Was it really that bad? That bad? Really like this, that bad? This, okay, this week's film has got not a lot of love. We even ran a poll, and it got the most votes for uh, a redemption of like, was it really that bad? Some like one of my friends in Australia, AJ, even committed, commented that this film was atrocious. Oh, no. So what's also funny about that is though, um, it has a higher audience score than a tomato meter. So the tomato meter well, is that's 47%. not uncommon these days. Touche. And the audience hmm. meter is sixty five percent, but forty seven percent tomato meter, not great. So this is the third installment of the reboot of the X Men series after uh, X Men First Class, and then um, Dawn of Future, the old uh, the time lapse one. Days of Future, and, future then, past. and then now we have Apocalypse. Here we are, Apocalypse, played by Oscar Isaac, in a just truly, just like he he stripped down to his bare bones to play this role. You would never know it's Oscar Isaac if if they he's would so good, dude. It. <laughs> he's so good at it. I mean, you would oh have no idea it's him. You'd have no All idea. Right. Now I, I can't remember. Did, like last last week, did I did I, I I bagged this movie out a little bit last week, didn't I? Like you when we well, you talk shit about Oscar Isaac. I think you said yeah, he was too yeah. short to play Apocalypse. Yeah. Come on, dude. Uh, he's, he's so too good. Short, Dave. Come straight on. up, so I'm, good, straight dude, up, I'm gonna so take good. that back. I will take that back. Um, he's so because, good, dude. Yeah. He gives it his Juilliard best, dude. That man will, gave you every <laughs> bit of acting technique he has in this movie. I will. Yeah, I'll. I'll tell. I'll. I'll go into why I didn't enjoy this so much the first time All around right. uh, well, yeah, when we get ahead. into it. But uh, I, I mean, feeling feeling this though, I think I think we should bring up at least one thing. Like, uh, and it's a little bit of a serious note. The uh, this is two Brian Singer things we've kind of covered, and I I feel a little bit uh, weird with the uh, allegations that are going on at the moment, and this are still going on. Uh, so I feel like we should address the fact that Brian Singer has a lot of allegations against him at the moment. But I feel like in discussing this movie, we need to say that we don't condone this behavior in any way. And our discussion focuses on the performances of the cast of actors, the hard work of the crew, and the phenomenal talent of the visual effects teams that were assembled by the production company to make this film. Yeah, but fuck Brian Singer. He also looks like a... He also looks like a... <laughs> Yeah, he also he also he also looks like a smug piece of shit. If you look at a picture of him, you're like this yeah. guy. Man. Okay, you know what? I sat on the fence about this, but fuck Brian Singer. You're right. Yeah. No, no, Dave, I mean, you did look, the right thing. That, that is our official yeah. statement for sure. Yeah, like no, clean. I mean, clean up your act. If Hollywood can clean up their act in general, I'll be very very happy because, like, as someone who is right. on the ground floor coming in, I would like to see a little bit of a cleaner operation. Mm-hmm. And you know, would a background check be out of line? Because let's face it, the allegations here go back twenty years. Yeah, over twenty years. He was officially fired from Bohemian Rhapsody or stepped aside. Whatever the fuck, it doesn't matter. He's gone. Yeah, Bohemian he, Rhapsody is gonna be the he, last movie he directs, probably. Yeah. Um, Just can't get away with shit like that. It's too bad no, because the usual suspect, nor should you. Of course, so, of course. The usual suspect <laughs> is so good, but that is not any excuse. It's no. Excuse. He's made some good movies. It's just it's not acceptable. I mean, <clears throat> if you if you Google if you Google Brian Singer, number one, sexual assault, number two, scandal. The top news articles: he caused an accident to Hugh Jackman because he was incapacitated. Like all this shit. You know what? I, I don't know what took us so long, but you know he made movies that were successful, especially starting from the Usual Suspects. This is his first big one. And then, but we're talking about teenagers and, you know, yada, yada, yada. The first two X-Men. When the Me Too movement started, I feel like up until that point, this shit was being enabled. Like, they were like, this guy can make us a lot of money, let's do it. But now, thankfully, that is not acceptable. 
Absolutely so get, not accepted. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Dave. That were, you, you said you just wanted to get right to the movie, and we're sitting here and we're like, fucking Brian Singer. Okay, sorry yeah, about yeah, that. Yes. Okay, let's get to the film Apocalypse. So basically, this movie opens, and it's actually not X-Men. It's actually The Mummy. I don't know if you knew that, Dave. They, they actually um, were talking to the team that was doing the Tom Cruise reboot. <laughs> Is that Billy Zane? I, I have this... I have this. Maybe this isn't the right terminology. Everybody I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna print. I'm gonna print my my first draft of this. Oh. So I call it exploitative filmmaking, and I think exploitative usually is when, when it comes to humans, like people. Was so a Brian Singer. Maybe maybe not the best terminology after that opening, but whenever <laughs> for for me, I think the best example of of exploiting real events of the past for your dramatic purposes is just think about this. How many Nazi movies are there? And then how many movies just all of a sudden have Nazi elements of them? Like like every superhero movie dates back to the Nazis. And it's like, well, we need some circumstances and stakes. And when were the stakes higher than when the Nazis were clearly bad and we were clearly good? Good versus evil. We won. Everything's great. So we just every year there's a new Nazi film and it drives me insane. Going back to Egypt for this film to start it out, because here's the truth. Here's the truth. X-Men is all about the genetic mutation, all right? And the Brian Singer film, X-Men 1, I can't keep saying his name, fuck. But X-Men, when, when it came out, they were like, I know this is in the comic books, but just so everybody knows, we're trying to set it in some form of reality. Obviously, it's not real, real, but let's just say there's a genetic mutation, so it's literally physical, that helps them do these, these superhuman, super physical, whatever things that, that mutants can do, and it's vague. But at least it comes from this grounded place. To immediately make it Egyptian gods were actually just mutants. That seems really exploitative. Now, after you get through it, tell me that's not true, though. I mean, all of a sudden, what, really? The Egyptians were mutants? I mean, they weren't, like, come on. One guy. <laughs> anyway. No, but the other people had superpowers, too. The, the other people that were bringing... Yeah, the other people that were bringing it, Apocalypse, that they, they were bringing him back to life at the time, they, they all had superpowers. Horsemen. And the horsemen all were, were mutants or they all just like he, he didn't just give them anyway. And now all of a sudden we're getting very beyond metaphysical and we're getting into fantasy. And, and you know what? Ultimately, that's fine. There's a lot of really, really fun elements of this movie. I think Days of Future Past was more interesting for sure. And then this movie, they decided that they weren't done with Days of Future Past. I don't know when this movie is. So I'm assuming if Magneto was so he's what is this 1970s? But but Wolverine 80s. is old. They're in but the Jean 80s. Grey is young. They're in the anyway, 80s. Night Nightcrawlers wearing wearing the jacket from Thriller. They're in the, the 80s. Wol- the Wolverine thing doesn't quit. The timeline of the Wolverine doesn't quite check out with Jean Grey and everything. But anyway, it's there's a lot of fun stuff in this. But as far as a film, not the most linearly like it, it doesn't check out what do you guys think what do you guys think okay i hate this that. but I, th- I i feel like you you sound like a star trek nerd at a convention it's like in this episode this happened because of this and this but like they fucked up the timeline in the movie before it so all bits are off yeah they did do that on purpose okay which, did, did that work yeah. for you guys or not work for you guys like because if if you if you watch these in order Again, to any of our hardcore fans, we did not talk about the X-Men franchise on our franchise face-off. When you do watch these in order, it works. Because Days of Future Past resets the timeline. If you don't yes. know that, you are fucking lost in this movie and the Wolverine yeah. Oh, yeah. movie that came out after this. Right. You have well, no and they idea make it, they make it... what the fucking time it is and no. how they and don't they made... know each other. And... and they made the joke about this in Deadpool, right? This had already this had already checked out. This was already like printed yeah. and sealed, and they're already making fun of it at this point. Deadpool's getting too. a lot of mentions this time around. <laughs> but yeah. but they don't go full because they know that you still understand the first two films of 2001, I guess, is the first one. So even though the timelines, as far as what is physically happening is going on, the character relationships is... They, they draw on it because they know that's what we expect. They're playing with our expectations of that kind of stuff a little bit. They don't rewrite everything. They do not erase the whiteboard, I don't think. Anyway, sorry, you go back to what you're I saying. I agree with you. I am... I am. It's a little inconsistent, I'll give you that. It's a little inconsistent. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to go to bat for this movie just because... It was fun. It was fun, a, for sure. I am a sucker for X-Men. I, anyone who listens to us will also know that I love Batman, but the only cartoon I really watched regularly and played toys I played with regularly growing up out of the whole Marvel world were the X-Men. So I've, I haven't loved all these movies, but I do enjoy tuning in for them because one, they're outside of the Marvel machine. So it's always interesting seeing what Sony does with them. 
yeah. uh, just because they don't feel like the rest of the Marvel Universe. So some of them stand <laughs> alone as like these not individual anymore. installments. Kiss that goodbye. <laughs> yeah, I guess they're absorbed now. Uh, <laughs> not to give him too much credit, but the first and second X-Men are really great, and he did both of those. Um, second one especially is is really awesome. So every time I tune into these, it's just fun getting to watch this world play out because if that doesn't work for you, what we were just talking about with the timelines and all that stuff, if that doesn't work for you, I totally mm. understand and respect that. It's hard to pay attention that much. But if you do pay attention, I do think it's interesting because, I don't know, these characters have existed in multiple timelines in the cartoon, the comic book, and the movie series. And again, if you, I, I think if you're attuned to that, it, they do pull it off all the way up through where they landed with Logan at the end of this. Yeah. So I feel like it was, um, I don't know. I've been waiting to see what they were going to do with Apocalypse for a very long time. This is a rewatch for me. I'd seen it whenever it came out. Um, it's a larger than life storyline in the comics and the cartoon. And it's almost like, how the fuck are they going to do that? So they got a good actor for the part, which made a huge difference. Yeah, they did. And I did think, I did think they did a good job of, if you follow X-Men at all, you're just waiting for Jean Grey to turn into the Phoenix. Like she's just the strongest mutant in the universe that has ever lived. And you're just always on the edge of your seat when they're going to let her be revealed. And they did it gently in the earlier movies, which is really cool, especially the end of the first one with her in the water and stuff. So if we all went into this one knowing she's the only one who brings Apocalypse down, if you follow the storyline at all. Mm. So I thought they did a pretty good job of teasing it out and you know, making you earn seeing her finally I, explode. I noticed how you, you skipped over X Men Three Abomination. Mm. Hey, skip, skip, even skip, this skip, yeah. this movie this movie makes fun of that, doesn't it? Remember when they say mm -hmm. they're talking shit about the Star Wars trilogy? Yeah, and the, like, third well, the third one is the worst. One. The worst. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, at least you know, at least you know, because yeah. it, it is the worst. But uh, yeah, I don't know. What did you guys think? This screenplay has some really dud lines in it that are not necessary. Yeah. That I think may have made a big difference. Um. I did have a note about lazy writing. I took it out because by the time I got three quarters of the way through this, I was enjoying it too much to actually stick with that yeah, note. Yeah, it was, it was All right, fun. so you're enjoying it. Yeah, get on there. Yeah. Tell me, you're, Dan, you enjoy Dan, it too. Jump in. I mean, okay, I'll, I'll draw a capital criticisms. It's like, damn, the thing he wore in the opening had to be hot in the fucking desert. Like, he's fully encased in shit. They're carrying him to the desert in Egypt. It's like, uh, all right. It's a lot um, of direct sunlight. Also, Dan. there are some, it's like, it's just like wear you know, it's like wearing a hoodie and jeans in Australia. Uh it's there are some brutal deaths in the opening of this. There's some brutal deaths later in this. Like yeah. look, they kicked it up a notch with the graphic violence a little bit. Yeah. And I did kind of draw a criticism at why was that pyramid so fucking poorly constructed? Why did it have a Death Star weakness? I feel like two load-bearing pillars would not be of out of order in this case. Like I had no idea that most of the pyramids collapsed because a mutant from the past with right with, behind with, um, one carpet powers brought them down. I had no. All you idea. have to do is I, raise a I, carpet, and, and there are two like, pegs holding up the destruction of this and entire pyramid. Yeah, and I, I feel like that was the thing that like brought this movie like a lot of the problems that it got was like, they started off so epic with an epic destruction scene and then they brought it right back down. It's like, well, how like you've kind of, you peaked in your yeah, first they, five they, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then they kind of, they started introducing characters like the nightcrawler angel fight. That was, was awesome. When what an introduction. And I love I'm nightcrawler. Sorry. Yeah. Both yeah. times they've introduced nightcrawler on screen. They yes. fucking nailed it with the casting in my opinion. Like it is a like both both times they cast amazingly. Yeah, um, I have to say the like a new storm origin story this late in the game should not have worked, but it fucking did. Like it worked, I loved I loved her new origin story. I love like well like the original origin origin story. I guess but I agree. Like yeah, like her introduction of her character and her journey, even though it was kind of thrown off to the side, really. Like there was enough there to give you like, okay, Storm's on board now and we've got Storm. Yeah. And I like the new character. I like the introduction of like her look and everything. Um Quicksilver. It's the Fuck best me. it's the best Fuck slow me, motion. It's, it's the best it's slow the motion best, sequence it's I've the ever best seen. Dude. Sequence in the film. Yeah. Like like he is my favorite version of that character on screen ever. Yeah. Like I really hope yeah. if they do move on, they keep that character, if nothing else. 
that actor, yeah. American Horror Story. What's his name, Jeff? I'm sure Evan you know his Peters. name. Yeah. Wow. The guy nailed is, it. He's, he's continues great, to nail it consistently. Like, but that that scene in this particular movie is it's worth watching the movie just for that fucking scene. It's hilarious and fun, but also ominous and threatening at the same time. Yep, I totally agree. But also, I, I don't have say I have to say, like, I'm, I'm watching this movie. I'm sitting there. and I'm thinking, wow, you know what? Given the state of the world right now, I'm kind of on Team Apocalypse. On Team Apocalypse, yeah. <laughs> it's make it, it's time to, you're on Thanos' side. No, yeah. Right? yeah. Remember I, when I was let's, arguing let's, for Thanos? <laughs> dude, seriously, Thanos Apocalypse 2020. Let's go. They were they have the same <laughs> color scheme. Did you notice that? Why, why are yeah, all the Marvel yeah, yeah. evil <laughs> characters like kind of purpley blue? Uh, what do you guys think about Jennifer Lawrence as, as a young mystique Raven? I didn't love her in the first one. I didn't love her in this one. And I'm not faulting her. I just don't know if I like her cast in that role. I thought it was I, great. I, it didn't bother you at all? I, I really not liked Rebecca Romaine Stamos in the yeah, originals. No, that was great. I don't feel but like, like Jennifer Lawrence is the younger he, version of that. <laughs> I mean, she, yeah. I I felt like she did a great job. I don't know who very... else I would have wanted. It, it, it didn't. She's a good actor. She's a great actor. It's not that yeah. at all. It just, it just didn't quite sink for me. But they also didn't know it's a. De- that she's clearly a huge star, and she's Mystique, who is dressed in blue, and and they've always been having to grapple with that. Well, you have the greatest star under contract for three films. Um, not to mention she obviously had a breakup, uh, although they work through that, that that has nothing to do with the film or the filmmaking or anything, but, um, they clearly like had her. And so they needed I her in her skin. Right I I mean, hear they him, <laughs> almost heavy handed with like showing her yeah. almost heavy handed with showing her, um, physique, if you will. Um, yeah. in her first entrance, because they were like, we got the star, she's under contract, and that's actually her. That's really her, she's not in blue, and look at her. So they did that a little bit, and they, they gave her the storyline where they made her an in, in idol, and that, that comes from the movies before, obviously. And and I, 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 I kind of felt this way with Hunger Games 3 and 4, where it's basically like the writers didn't necessarily was, know what to do with her, so they relied on her four? to make up her. <laughs> So they were they were they were really relying on her. It, it was almost like they were praising her while they were writing for her, if that makes sense. And I felt like that happened in this movie where they were she had the hero effect where she was like the um the hero who returned home sort of thing. And it was a good element for people. I'm sure it made the producers happy to see it on the script, but I don't know if she had a lot to play with that would have mm. th- there was nothing interesting in it. I'll put it that way. I mean they, I they, can they tell had you, like because yeah, I, anyway, I, I, I like I made some disparaging comments about this film and I think the reason was that I, I listened to the online interpretation of it, like that everybody bagged the fuck out of this, the world around. It's like, it sucks. It's abysmal. We even had, uh, you know, one of my friends, AJ from Australia, comment that yeah. uh, this this film is atrocious. Yeah, yeah. And in I listened to like all the earlier stuff and I watched this on a long haul flight to Australia when I was like, it was the third movie in I'm on a fucking 16 hour flight. I'm half asleep. I missed half the stuff. And I really did this movie a disservice because on this, on a rewatch, this is actually a really like, it's a good film. It's a great villain performance. It's awesome. Introduction Mm -hmm. to new characters. The 46% on Rotten Tomatoes is really fucking undeserved in my opinion. I think so too, dude. I'm glad you said that. Cause I remember when I saw this, when it came out and I remember thinking this isn't, Great. It's not as good. It's certainly not as good as the best X Men movies, Days of Future Past, X Men Two, and X-Men maybe two is, you're never Origins if that. you like those. Yeah. But it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not X Men mm. Three. It's 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 definitely not a bad movie. And I feel like it's, everybody talked fun. a lot of shit about yeah. it. Yeah, it's I really sat there fun. and I enjoyed it. They got Jeff, all I know what you mean. To your point. Involved. To your point. I know what you mean about like this movie is the Mummy, but I am a sucker for anything from that era that time well, period and i thought they pulled it off i i would have been a little more satisfied if it was a different civilization than egypt if it yeah. was like babylon or anything yeah. early early yeah. civilization it didn't have to be egypt but i guess they did obviously have to bring home the point that he was called Ra at one point so at some point he was you know he was literally what we think of as god and again i didn't it didn't bother me at all i totally bought it like he was god and what do you guys think right. about, since, let's just bring it back. Let's just zoom out just a little bit. I have always been super attracted to X-Men because this comic book grew out of the civil rights movement about people, mm. the themes of people feeling that they don't belong and how do they navigate being a part of civilization? And 
once again, it all boils down to the relationship between Eric and Xavier, Magneto yeah. and Professor and Xavier, and they Fassbender, they, Fassbender they brought it home finally, to this. Fassbender finally got to like bust his acting chops a little, like yeah. Mm-hmm. When yeah, he was I mean conf- everything that when happens he was confronted to him. in Poland. Yeah, it was like that was that was a no, great the scene. performance. It's just, it just it took, yeah. it took me back to the uh, the conversations we were having with the franchise stuff. Like when a theme is good enough, and the acting the acting has to be there too. Obviously, all the elements have to be there, but the acting has to be there too. When a theme is strong enough, it's inexhaustible. And mm. every single movie, it comes back to Eric Magneto. You don't have yeah. to do this. No one has to take on the pain that you have been given. It's not fair that it's come to you, but no one else deserves what you have had to receive. And every single time with the good ones, the three or four really good ones within this franchise, it lands and it makes you feel that way. So I'm not a huge fan of the very last moment of this film where Jennifer Lawrence is telling them, you're X-Men now and we're, we're training. But that last moment between yeah, that Xavier was a setup and Eric. For a sequel if I've ever yeah, heard one. Definitely. But that, last moment, that last moment between the two of them it really lands for me. Like they connect once again. And you also believe that Magneto, Magneto might not be pure evil, that he is capable of love and he's just been, you know, hurt people, hurt people. And I thought this movie, I thought it landed. And I also love, I know it's obvious, but when she finally fucking comes out and blows up in terms of the Phoenix and he says, yeah, so. all has been revealed. That mm-hmm. like his only actual mission was to discover the pure like power. I th- I thought it landed. I, I really did. I thought Oscar yeah. was fa- yeah, fantastic. She's the, and she's the one that's, that's going to complete my mission. Yeah. Yes. Like no, she is what I've actually been searching for. She yeah. trumped me, for lack of a better word. I'm it's sorry, a, America. It's a fun movie. <laughs> yeah. So back to our franchise thing, where we were talking about rewatching full franchises. We did not include X Men. We went with Avengers, and we just put this off to the side. But this is a. This is not a, you know what? It doesn't even necessarily feel like the final installment. You know what I mean? So actually it segues really well into Logan. And yeah, they kind of set it up because, and I had no idea. I mean, this went dark, too, dark Phoenix we'll happens as well. Again. Like Dark the, Phoenix. This, yeah. this leads no one directly into yeah. no, Dark no, no, Phoenix. No, no, no. Dep- no yes, again, I, I yes. watched that on a plane and given the experience I had with this one, I'm going to rewatch it this week. Yeah. 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 Logan was no, for sure. But, but, but this, especially in context of the previous two films, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're really interesting characters. Really, really great. That Quicksilver we talked about at the slow mo is is really special. Dave, so, yeah. the way they split, the, the way Cyclops splits the tree, like there there are some really, really interesting sequences. That yeah, done James McAvoy yeah. as well. Like I, I love him. I know, yeah, Jimmy dude. Mac. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know I'm giving some shit about Jennifer Lawrence, but it, uh, th- that that's not her, I'm not super not her passionate about that. I'm, no, I'm not even super passionate about it. I think across the board, the casting is actually really strong. Nicholas Holt is yeah, is He's Hank awesome. McCoy is Beast. Is beast. We talked about Oscar Rose Byrne. I liked her in the other one too. Evan Peters, the guy, the kid who plays Cyclops. I don't even know who plays him in this one. Ty Sheridan. I, I thought everybody. Ty was... Sheridan. He was in Ready Player One, which was not a great Steven Spielberg film. Sorry, Steven oh, Spielberg. That was but him, he's dude. the Thank lead you. in Ty Sheridan. Fuck you. Yeah, it was. And then let's talk about that's her because like, we haven't talked like, about it yet. That's like my, that's what? like my third favorite movie ever. Uh, yeah, you're goddamn mind. It, it, it was okay. Uh, <laughs> just for Sophie Turner. <laughs> let's talk about Sophie Turner. Let's talk about uh-huh. Sansa. Did you guys like her in this? This was, I think, this was the first thing I saw her in outside yeah. of Game of Thrones. Was that is that true? Am I? That was, this is the first yeah, big movie much. she's been in outside yeah. of Game of yeah. Thrones, right? I liked yeah, her. It was, I, she, yeah, did, she, she didn't she bother did, me at all. I love yeah. the woman she, well, who plays she, Jean Grey in the early ones, but I, I really yeah, liked she, her. She as really as she she actually studied her to for this role. So like, yeah, they, didn't bother me at all. I thought yeah. she was just fine. I, I totally bought it. I enjoyed it. When she fucking walks out and was like, give it up. Yeah. I liked it, you guys. This was not a bad movie. We redeemed no, this, this movie. Is good. Fuck anyone we who talks about this movie. <laughs> Go and watch this movie. Disney like, Plus. Disney Plus. Disney Plus. It's right now. Disney it's there. It's, it's you know like, what else? It, it bit me right in the ass, too. I'm definitely going to watch some X-Men movies this week, you guys. This movie, yeah. I watched it, and I was like, damn it, this movie's not that bad. I kind of want to watch some more X-Men movies. Well, now that you have Disney yeah. Plus, it's so easy to dive yeah, in. Just well, skip, you, X- well, just skip fast. X-Men 3. You mentioned it. You mentioned it. Dave, I think you said it didn't quite work for you. That Wolverine was that, who was that? Which one of you said the Wolverine thing didn't quite work for you? Me, that because the timelines were the timelines were confusing. Yeah, but it's okay. Yeah. But did you actually? Did you mind? Because it, 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 it was a happened? prequel. It was it was an I mean, arrival the, thing. The, the yeah, Wolverine no, yeah, for film sure. That was fun. Yeah, the in Wolverine the theaters, film didn't it, work for Jay, for um, Ron Reynolds either, really, because he paid it out in Deadpool. Well, you didn't like the moment in, though. In, 
in the theater, I remember people applauding. It was awesome. Yeah, for sure. But you didn't like, cool. yeah. I mean, that finally, like, that was the that was the seed. That was the that was the first connection between Jean Grey yeah, I wish, and Wolverine. Yeah, like that, yeah, I, yeah. No, that makes sense. It uh-huh. checks out. I wish they didn't have the cheesy me. line beforehand. They were like, "It was a man who's lost a part of himself," and then he comes out. Like, I wish they didn't have that. But yeah, there was really, it was really cool. It was really cool. A lot of cheesy lines. When Jennifer Lawrence, uh, not a cheesy line. And this actually touched me. I actually rewound this moment when she slices apocalypse's throat and sacri- like do you think she's gonna die that touched oh, me dude spoiler yeah that got me oh come on who gives a shit <laughs> X-Men apocalypse yeah. watch this fucking movie it doesn't fucking thanks matter for making all. it to the end of this podcast everybody that's, next that's week not the end of the movie <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> next week well come on the next week the three films that we are going to be talking about from the film year 1996 96. Are, we are, of course, we have to get our first Coen Brothers movie in there. So we are going to do their signature film, Fargo, Coen Brothers Fargo, oh, 1996. Yeah. Way, to, way to dip your toe in the water. Yeah, no, we're Holy coming straight Holy shit. Out. Then we are going to back that up with, I thought it was going to come to me, uh, Romeo and Juliet, Baz Luhrmann, You're Leonardo still DiCaprio, not making notes? Claire James, and then our redemption <laughs> film of the week directed by ben stiller i'm pretty sure his feature directorial <laughs> debut oh, oh he should have stopped cable guy cable it's gonna be guy. fun i'm excited everybody talked a bunch of shit jim about carrey, that movie baby. when i was kid, jim carrey so just had a book come happens. out so let's do it all right fantastic episode gentlemen any parting words no, we've watch kept these them up movies. late enough. All, all yeah. three of these movies are great. You should have watched. Yeah, we should watch all, all these great. movies this week. They're all good. I enjoyed them. Hmm. All right. All right Till next time. <laughs>